right. Good afternoon, everyone. It is great to be here at the Oberia D. Dempsey Multi Service Center, which does so much for the community, uplifting the community in many ways, including social services and education programs and cultural programs. And I want to thank uh, West Harlem Group Assistance, uh, which does so much here at this location. I want to thank them for all they are doing to make sure that people in Harlem and people all over have safe and decent and affordable homes. Uh, what's happening here is an example we wanted to show you all of what you're going to be seeing a lot more of, affordable housing preserved in our communities and helping people stay in the neighborhoods they love in a way they can afford. You know, this is the issue that so many New Yorkers care about. Can they stay in their home? Can they stay in the neighborhood they love? Our answer is yes. More and more, we are creating new affordable housing that can allow people the opportunity to stay in their neighborhood, to stay in the city they love. And more and more, we're preserving affordable housing. Literally, families able to stay in their apartment and get support from the city and in many cases get their apartments rehabbed in the process so there'll be a quality place for a family to live for decades to come and affordable for decades to come. So that's what we're celebrating here today. The work in this neighborhood is extraordinary. Work's underway to, preserve, to improve and preserve 358 affordable apartments at 28 buildings here in Harlem. And the apartment we just visited, a great example, had been dilapidated now, is being fully rehabbed, new floors, new appliances, paint job, everything is going to be uh, the right kind of quality for a family to live in in 2016. People get this affordable housing. I said a lot of it is for people already living in the unit and find that it can now be preserved for the long haul and they can stay in that affordable apartment. But for folks who are part of our lotteries, who are they? Well, every kind of New Yorker. Uh, nurses and mechanics and custodians and childcare workers, every kind of New Yorker is looking for affordable housing and have an opportunity to get affordable housing through the process we've created. 358 apartments. Now these 358 apartments will work from a clear income standard. For an individual, you would have to make an income of no more than 36300 a year. For a family of three, no more than 46620 a year. So for many, many New Yorkers, this falls into the range of their income, and these are folks who really need affordable options. And then once in the affordable apartment, a 30-year guarantee of affordability and clear standards for how much people pay in rent, no more than 30% of income. In addition, 20% of the apartments that are being renovated, and that means 70 apartments, will be set aside for the formerly homeless, giving people a chance to have good quality, affordable housing be back on their feet. And again, people will have an affordable rent in a newly renovated apartment, a place they can be proud to call home. The developer, Genesis Companies, has really done remarkable work. There's a company founded here in this community uh, that's devoted to this community and has done great work, as we saw next door, turning apartments that were dilapidated into beautiful new apartments. And not just the apartments are getting rehabbed, the whole building, the boilers and the roofs and the energy systems, everything's being updated. So we're very proud to be working with Genesis, and we thank them for the extraordinary work they do. They happen to be an MWBE firm, and they're a firm that's taking part in our administration's efforts to get more and more work to MWBE firms. And we're seeing great results. We're seeing more and more firms getting opportunity and doing the great kind of work you see here. We believe that our affordable housing plan can serve many goals simultaneously. It can also, in addition to creating affordable housing for hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, can also create economic opportunity and create opportunities for firms that are based in the community 
to get much more work and in turn to hire community residents to do that work. And that's something we believe in, making sure those dollars stay in the community. And Genesis has a great a reputation, a great history, and understands how much we have to create affordability for the long run. I want to thank members of my administration who are here, who have really been the engines of this affordable housing plan. When we talk about this extraordinary plan, the biggest affordable housing plan in the country, the people behind it get so much credit because they have made this work no matter how high the goals, no matter how tough the mission. I want to thank our Housing Preservation and Development Commissioner, Vicki Bean, our President of the Housing Development Corporation, Gary Rodney, and our Small Businesses Commissioner, Greg Bishop, for the great, great work they're doing. Now, I've said very clearly, if we don't address the affordability crisis, if we don't create a lot more affordable housing and preserve a lot more affordable housing, it simply won't be the same New York City anymore. Thousands and thousands of people will be displaced if we don't act and act now. Even a plan as bold as 200,000 affordable apartments won't cover every need. We have to keep going thereafter. But we have to do what we're doing now aggressively. We have to get those apartments done as quickly as humanly possible. We've given ourselves a goal of 2024, but I'll tell you, every single apartment we can get in the hands of a family that needs one, we want to do it as quickly as possible. And that takes us to the work we're doing today. When we preserve an apartment in place, it has an absolutely amazing impact for a, a family. It means that they go from a situation where they don't know if their apartment will be affordable, and in many cases, they do know their apartment is not good enough quality, to knowing they have the assurance of affordability for decades to come and seeing before their very eyes the repairs they wanted for years finally being made. And that's already happened with 26,000 apartments in this city under the two years we've been at it through our affordable housing plan. 26,000 apartments have been reached already, over 2,000 of them here in Harlem. That's part of that 120,000 apartments that are core to our plan. But another 80,000 apartments will be newly built. And I've said many times, the status quo that we used to live by just doesn't work in this town anymore. The status quo was that developers would offer their plans, and their plans didn't have affordable housing in them, or sometimes had vague commitments to affordable housing, and lo and behold, we didn't get the affordable housing we needed in our communities. People didn't have enough options. Too many people had to leave. Well, we're changing those rules. We're putting demands on the real estate industry. We're saying that in today's day and age, we need to require the creation of affordable housing. And we are working closely now with the City Council, and you're going to hear from Council Member Dickens in just a moment. I want to thank her for her leadership. She is someone who knows a lot about housing, who knows a lot about how to get it uh, built and to what impact it makes on a community. Uh, we are working right now with the Council on something that is critically important. Mandatory inclusionary zoning will change the rules of the game. It will fundamentally change the city's ability and improve the city, city's ability to create affordable housing. This is going to be a watershed moment. I've said it and I believe it. People are going to look back at March of 2016 and realize it was a decisive moment because it will be the time with the help of the City Council that this city will say that we must ensure an affordable city going forward and we must require developers to create affordable housing or there simply won't be enough. The market realities of today will not take care of our senior citizens, will not take care of low-income families. We have to intervene and that's what mandatory inclusionary zoning will allow. And I have to tell you, our seniors are particularly clear on this topic, and there's more and more seniors in the city. People are living longer, and that is a tremendous blessing. Uh, the, the percentage of this city's population that will be senior will be growing in the years to come. Seniors need affordable housing options. I've talked to a lot of seniors, and they're very quick to tell me that they have fixed incomes. Their incomes aren't going up, but the price of housing is going up, and they need an answer. They need solutions. And the laws governing where we can create 
uh, create affordable housing for seniors are literally more than half a century old. They don't work anymore. That's why we proposed zoning for quality and affordability, to update the laws, to maximize our opportunities to create affordable housing, in particular for seniors, to do things we can't do now because we have to do things differently if we're going to address this affordability crisis. Let me just say a few words in Spanish before I introduce the council member. Hoy estamos celebrando el progreso en la preservación de más de 350 unidades de vivienda asequible en Harlem. Estos serán apartamentos para las familias trabajadoras que han ayudado a construir este vecindario. Proyectos como este son una parte esencial de nuestro plan para crear una ciudad más justa al alcance de todos. As I mentioned, a council member Inez Dickens is a real expert on housing. She's devoted her life to working in the community and particularly to maximizing the chance that people could afford to live here. We've worked very closely together and she has fought to protect Harlem throughout. We served in the council together and I've seen what a formidable presence she can be. And I want to thank her in particular. We had another decisive moment for Harlem at the end of last year, the Riverton complex, almost 1,000 apartments hanging in the balance, could have been all privatized, would have been lost as affordable housing. And thanks to the good work of the council member and members of my administration, those units were saved, those apartments were saved. That's the work we have to do day after day to protect affordable housing in this city. I want to welcome council member Inez Dickens. I'll get you taller. That's fair, Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. I, I want to thank Mayor de Blasio for taking on a, a, a problem that impacts upon everyone here in the city of New York when none of the administrations had really taken it on to attack what's necessary, and that's the maintenance of affordable housing the creation of affordable housing and the renovation of affordable housing in order for families to continue to live in, in our communities. So I thank him because this was something that was very difficult. It was not easy. And a lot of people complained that he didn't move fast enough. But I say he did. He had to take his time so that it was done correctly and lasting. See, that's the, the, the issue, is it has to last past his administration, past mine, so that families can stay here. Commissioner Vicki Bean, thank you for, for all that you have done. I've met with you repeatedly, and you uh, listen to the council members, and I thank you for that. And Gary Rodney of HDC, thank you, Donald Notis, for agreeing to host us here at, at, at Oberia Dempsey, West Harlem Group Assistance, has done phenomenal work here in the community, including affordable housing, so thank you. Kareem Hudson, Genesis, working with Commissioner Greg Bishop of SBA. Thank you, Greg, for fighting for MWBE. You've been doing it a long time. It's just now you got the commissionership, the title, and the problems inherent with it. <laughs> <laughs> the regulatory agreement, as the mayor said, will preserve affordable housing. And the key component to what we saw at the building is that families will not be removed. And that's critical. We need new housing built. But those housing stock that we presently have has to be made viable. Genesis is installing brand new HVAC systems so that heat and hot water will be available. There will be windows put in that will be, have the weather stripping that's necessary. Not just the cosmetics, but the systems, the upgrading of the plumbing and the upgrading of the electrical system in order to make these housing units viable in the 21st century. So I wanted to say thank you to the mayor and thank you to the administration and his staff. And one other key component I, that the mayor did not mention, and I want to thank him for, is that the major capital improvement costs will not be passed on 
to the residents, yes. which is frequently done. Yes. And it was not mentioned, but Kareem, and, and I want to mention that to Brian. Benjamin, thank you so much, because that's critical to keeping our housing stock affordable. And I want to thank my speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, for taking the leadership role that she has. And yes, I have not said so publicly, but I want to thank the mayor and his staff for the fight that they did in order to ensure the protection of more than 1,300 residents at Riverton at 135th Street and 5th Avenue. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're going to hear from Karim Hudson, who's it was that was your three week old that just yes, was uh, <laughs> was was demanding that you speak. <laughs> I was like, why is this taking so long? I want to hear my father. So, Karim, I want you to I want you to tell your story at the outset because you believed that you could do something extraordinary for this community. You're from here, and you believed that you could give back in a very real way, and to stand in that apartment with you and see an apartment that really had fallen into disrepair, brought back to life, to see an apartment that wasn't fit for a family, now made good for a family again. That you should be very, very proud of that. So we are really honored to be working with Genesis. And there's something particularly powerful about someone from the community helping the community get better and bringing in opportunity for affordable housing and for employment. Uh, that's exactly what we want to see more of, and we're proud of the work you've done. We welcome Karim Hudson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the mayor, thank the councilwoman, uh, thank President Rodney, Vicki Dean, thank Greg. We really appreciate uh, the support and the recognition that I think you are giving to a much needed problem that needs to be resolved. Uh, in, in the city of New York. You know, when we started Genesis in 2004, we've been around now, we're celebrating 12 years of existence. Um, you know, we had a vision that we could be developers that could actually do a quality job, uh, turn a, 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 a decent profit, but at the same time, um, do real quality work in the neighborhoods that we grew up. Um, we were tired of going around and walking around and seeing uh, neighborhoods and seeing buildings in the neighborhoods that we knew not built to the standards that we thought they should be built to. Um, and so that was our commitment at Genesis, was to figure out a way and to be committed to not only doing development in the highest quality way, but also being a community-based developer and listening to the needs of folks and being attentive to the needs of the community. And that's what our mission is here at Genesis. So we're very proud to be a part of this project, very proud of the commitment that the city uh, the councilwoman all have made to see that these units and these tenants have a better way. I have a three work, I have a three week old, and it's all at the end of the day about the next generation and what we are giving to them. And it has to be high quality housing. It has to be affordable housing. It has to give them the opportunity to live in the city where they grew up. And so I'm very proud to be a part of that legacy. Um, I just want to say quickly that um, thanks to the, the meaningful strategic investment from the city and other funding partners. Genesis Company is able to preserve 358 units of affordable housing across 28 buildings for local Harlem residents whose units have needed significant repair and work for years. We thank Mayor de Blasio and his team for recognizing that Genesis is a local community focused MWBE that has the capacity to, to deliver on a project of this scale and size. This represents a new day in Harlem where developers from the community are able to build and renovate projects in their community. I want to say two last, two other quick things. Um, you know, we've been on this project now uh, for less than a year. We started renovations, I believe, around July of 2000, when 16, right, 2015. Um, and um, in little, less, in little less than a year, we took buildings that had numerous violations, roofs that were completely dilapidated. Um, uh, hot, uh, hot water heaters that were inefficient and not working, apartments that were in terrible conditions. And in that time, and we haven't finished all the work, we have completed almost 25 or 28 roofs, 90% of new kitchens and bathrooms in these units. Um, we started uh, replacing old boilers with high, finish, high efficiency uh, boilers so that folks can have a much better quality of life. And we're gonna work hard to make sure we get that job done 
um, and we're ahead of schedule and ahead of budget. We, we're planning to finish towards the end of next year. We're gonna hopefully be finished, hopefully the first quarter of this year, so we can deliver this housing as soon as possible for these residents who need it. Um, there's one other thing that I, folks have not mentioned. Um, we've um, embarked upon what I think is a wonderful partnership um, with uh, Sobro Youth Build. Um, uh, this program, nonprofit, takes um, kids who are low income, who weren't necessarily on the right path. Um, Sobro has trained them and given them some skills in construction, and Genesis is hiring them, giving them the jobs. You know, this is the type of partnership that is required not only for us to do the housing, but to look to hire the local kids in the community who have the ability to participate so that they can benefit from the work that's happening here. So I believe this is gonna be a fantastic, fantastic project. We're making fantastic progress. We have more work to do. Come back and see us when we have the ribbon cutting mayor and we're gonna be celebrating, uh, uh, completing all the different renovations that we need to do. I thank you for your commitment. And I'm very proud to be here on stage. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, what were you saying, Inez? I grew up in that building. My great aunt lived in that building, so her death. In the building we were just in? Yes, in the building we were just in. Well, this is personal for you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much to both. All right, let's take questions about uh, the work being done here and about anything related to affordable housing, and then we'll do other topics. Yes. What, yeah, two questions. What is the rent that a tenant will pay in that unit that we were just in? And uh, there were two tenants from the building who were there um, trying to speak to you. Uh, one was complaining about conditions in the building in terms of uh, uh, dust in their apartment, saying that uh, they should have been relocated while the work was being done. Another was saying there's an infestation of bed bugs. So can you talk about the, the conditions and the problems of the tenants that remain in the building? I told the one of the tenants, I look forward to seeing them after this, and I go over and uh, with uh, my colleagues and hear what their concern is and make sure we're addressing it. Uh, and Karim and, and can talk to that as well and speak to that as well. In terms of the rent levels, uh, Vicki, Gary, Karim, who, who has the best way of describing that? Uh, Vicki, come on up. Hold on, making you tall. All right. Okay, so for example, um, so uh, as you know, uh, affordability is defined as 30% of the income. So these are typically at an income of about 36,000 for a family of one up to 46,000 for a family of three. So uh, it would be 30% of that is, is the maximum rent for the year. And that okay. could, just, just one second, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. that, that could, to clarify, when you say mm -hmm. up to means it could be a family of three at 45, Slightly. 40, mm -hmm. 30, whatever yes, it may exactly. be. And then exactly. it's 30% of uh, of the of the income that can be paid in rent, so we can get you Whatever. for the studios. I don't have that list with me, but we'll we'll get that we'll get the exact amount. For you. Adjusted income, yes, it's adjusted income. So we'll get you the actual rents for the studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, etc., because those have to be worked out. I just didn't carry that with me. Okay, but we can get that for you. Yeah, do you want to speak to yeah. the? Mm -hmm. So, so let me say this: I, we will definitely get you the exact rent for that studio. I think that's what you're asking for. Um, but um, just so we're clear, there has been no rent increases, um, and all the rents will be, if, there, if the rent is too high to meet the low-income housing tax credit rent, which is 30% of household income based on the AMI, then that rent is lowered. Um, so it will be affordable to those earning um, um, less than 60% of AMI, but we'll get you the exact rent. In terms of the complaints, um, you know, we're here for a reason. You know, Genesis is here because there were significant issues with these buildings. Um, um, and so um, we are uh, here on the ground every day. Uh, Genesis folks, the contractors folks, the property management folks, uh, we are open to hear every single complaint. We do monthly, weekly meetings with tenants. Um, we listen to the complaints. If there's a complaint uh, before we go into a building or before we go into a unit, we post a schedule of when work is gonna happen. Um, so we are not, you know, I live five blocks from here. So there's really nowhere for me to hide um, when I'm walking around the neighborhood and folks see me. Um, so um, do I think we do a perfect job? I'm not sure, but I think that we're listening to every single complaint that is there and we're rectifying and, 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 um, and trying to create a solution. But I will say that, you know, these buildings were in not great shape for a very, very long time and we're trying to do a lot of work 
quickly to resolve the units and not displace and not inconvenience to, and inconvenience the tenants as, as, as little as we possibly can. And most of the complaints will be abated Here, as on. the construction is done. Yes. So that although many people may have complaints, most of the complaints uh, are from prior to the construction starting. And so most of the, the complaints will be alleviated with the renovation of the units and, and any that may not be, the, uh, Genesis has have, does have a history of addressing all complaints in their buildings. And that's why um, we chose them uh, to be one of the developers to do such work as we're asking today. Can I just further follow up? That, you know, the important point that Karim made that the, uh, we don't want to see people displaced who need affordable housing. The goal is always to keep them in their units while work is being done. That has to be done the right way, obviously. So we have to always make sure we're listening for any concerns. There's some units like the one we're in that were already vacant. Those are gonna be rehabbed and then made available to other folks who need them. But a lot of our preservation effort is literally uh, doing the work while people get to remain in their home, which is what the vast majority of people, of course, want. Uh, on the uh, bed bug issue, we checked with one of the uh, building managers, and there has been a regular fumigation effort here in the building. I think they said the last time was last month. But we're certainly going to listen to the tenant to see if there's new concerns that have arisen. Okay, on this announcement or on affordable housing, Sally. Is it correct that once these buildings were rehabbed, they could, become, they could come out of affordability? Like, were they reaching a certain time frame in the affordable housing program? I'm sorry, were you saying before this? Certainly, is there, I know that they're being rehabbed, but apart from that, like were, they, were they reaching the end of their life? If they had not been, if this had not happened, you're saying what might have happened? Yeah, so were they which one of you knows the answer? If nothing had happened, what was going to happen to this building if we had not intervened? So I guess I, I would say uh, two things, Sally. One is that the buildings were not being kept up, and so they were declining rapidly. So even if they were technically in a preservation program, they weren't being kept up um, by the current owners, so by the previous owners. So we needed to correct that situation. They were reaching what we call year 15 in the low income housing tax credit program. So year 15 means that they still have 15 more years after that, but that, that's an opportunity to go in and we frequently go in at year 15 because that's often when systems needs to be replaced, et cetera. And then we extend the affordability out from there in exchange for you know repairing whatever <coughs> needs to be repaired at that time. So that was really two. 32, I believe it is, right? Yeah, so 32 years from now. 30 years from mm -hmm. this day. From this yeah. Right. So, okay. Yes. Ms. Mayor, you, you've gotten pushback from some groups across the city because of your affordable housing plan. And just recently, uh, one of the groups that was protesting you two weeks ago has now come on board with your plan, uh, real, affordability, real Affordability for All. How did you change their minds, sir? What were their concerns and how did you address it? You know, uh, RAFA is the acronym, and there are a lot of uh, folks in that organization, a lot of uh, the constituent members that I've worked with for years and years, and I think uh, it was always clear there were a lot of shared goals. And we uh, worked very hard throughout the process to show that we were really pushing the spectrum in terms of creating affordable housing in terms of uh, changing the rules of the game with the developers, in terms of maximizing the amount of affordable housing uh, for the lowest income New Yorkers. And I think it was important over a series of discussions to show the fullness of our plan, to answer the concerns and critique. And I think the more they saw, the more they recognized that we really were uh, doing things that had never been done before and that they would work. Um, you know, there's some ongoing issues that we're gonna explore together about continuing to deepen affordability in, in terms of you know, the best way to maximize local hiring and other issues that we think are very valid issues and we'll continue to work on together. But I think in the end, it was a process of showing that this plan could work. Uh, also, you know, seeing the broad support clearly was important. The fact that uh, AARP was such a strong supporter, the fact that so many of our unions were supporters, the fact that more and more council members were supporting it, I think that was important in the process too. Yes. So it was a promise of a study that was given to Ralph. Is something that way. Who's going to conduct that study? Is the city going to conduct yeah, that study? Yeah, the city will conduct that study. Okay. And, you know, what, 
what you know what exactly would be the parameters of that study? What like what is it trying to determine? What you know I guess that that's it's, it's, it's all it was a little bit vague exactly what the, what it just would entail. You know, I, the bottom line is they are, they are raising a set of issues about um, how, again, we maximize local hiring, maximize affordability, uh, perfectly fair issues that we want to look at. We want to look for any other ways we can go farther. So the exact scope of the study has not been fully determined, but it's something we intend to get to work on quickly. And uh, in the end, I think this is a kindred exercise. Nothing is static here. This is the plan that we believe is the maximum we can do right now. But we want to keep innovating. We want to find ways to do more because this affordability crisis is so real. So it's something we'll have more to say on as the study is, uh, is worked through. Following up on that similarly, is, is there an example of anything that did change through that negotiation? or? through their lobbying of the plan that you, know, you would highlight? Well, I think the, it's fair to say discussions are still going on with the council uh, as we speak. And I think when we get to the final product, we'll all be able to judge you know, the different ways that different folks contributed. But again, I think it is very normal for advocates to push the spectrum and push for the maximum. And I know they did that with the best of intentions. But I also think it's fair to say that Sometimes when people get to know a plan better, they see more to like about it. Um, so you know, we'll go through the process with the council and we get to a final product. Uh, we'll be able to you know, describe to you sort of how we got there. But I want to emphasize, I think, again, the council, it's been a very productive negotiation, uh, very much shared goals. Uh, council's doing its job and pushing us and you know, asking a lot of tough questions, but I think we're getting to a good place. OK, anything else on affordable housing? Yes. I mean, how close are we to, to a deal with the council? At this point? I, again, I think there's been uh, really productive discussions. They've been moving apace. Uh, I think we'll know a lot more shortly. I'm not going to give you a specific timeline, but um, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with what I see. Yeah. Um, on that a little bit further, isn't it that there also are some tweaks to the MIH formulas that led to Rafa feeling more comfortable about sort of supporting the plan, not necessarily getting to know the plan better, but actual numbers that they've been showing? Well, again, the, the uh, plan that we put forward, which has been in discussion with the council, continues to be in discussion with the council. Until that final product is available, it doesn't make sense to judge it. I think, and I don't want to speak for Rafa, obviously they can speak for themselves, but again, I believe they recognized uh, the extent of our plan and how our plan could be effective. I certainly believe that they, you know, are hopeful that the council process will yield a good result and that the study was an important uh, element for them to look about, look at what we can do next to deepen the plan. And again, on that, there's no lack of agreement. I, I want to really emphasis, emphasize this is not a static situation. This is, we want to get to a good plan with the council, we want to get this vote done, and then we want to get back to work looking for what more we can do. Yes? Some of the more uh, liberal members of the council have pushed for a 30% AMI and said they wanted you know, even deeper levels of affordability. In, in your estimation, what makes that difficult or prohibitive for the city to you know, embrace? Again, there's an ongoing negotiation, so I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. What, what has uh, been for us the underlying principle is that we needed to do more affordability in, than in the past. We did not believe in the 80-20 model. We had to surpass that. We had to reach uh, as much affordability in terms of reaching folks at lower income levels as we could, while at the same time providing a lot of housing for folks who, for example, are civil servants, you know, or custodians, as I mentioned, nurses. Like, we needed a lot of uh, housing for working people. We needed a lot of housing for low-income people. We tried to figure out the best mix. And in the process, uh, opening up the possibility of a lot more senior housing and putting some stringent rules on developers about the conditions under which they had to create uh, affordable. That's been the goal all along. We've always known there was going to be back and forth with the council on the numbers. We've always said we were open to that. Um, but until we get to a final product, it doesn't make sense to, to parse it. Can you talk about the study? What's going to happen after the results of the study are come back? Will there be changes to your two um, housing 
Well, I want to emphasize that first of all, the study has not been designed, and second of all, we haven't seen the results. So I think we're we're pretty we're premature in trying to judge. No, we've just begun. Again, this is something that uh, this coalition asked for us to buy into. We do, but it's a very initial idea. We'll work with them in good faith. But it's, you know, it's well enough off because we have to design it, we have to implement it, and then look at the recommendations. So I can't prejudge it. Go ahead. Did you? Just one more yeah. project here, uh, maybe for Mr. Hudson. Um, th so this, this deal was made, you said, last July was the start of construction? Yes. Can you just explain a little bit about, is this something that you would have been able to do without um, the benefit package that the city you know, has put in place here? And what were the negotiations like to sort of to get to the point of being able to take over these properties? Sure. So um, the answer is absolutely no. We would not have been able to get this done without the support of the city and without the support of our financial partners. Um, these projects, these, these units needed something around the uh, 65,000, I believe, a unit of, um, uh, of cost to go into uh, rehabbing these, 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 these units. So there's a significant amount of work that needed to go into these buildings in order for these, uh, these buildings to be performed, in order for them to be acceptable, I think from our standards, from the city standards. Um, and so I think from a, from a negotiation with the city, it was a very easy process because uh, as we see, tenants were living in very bad conditions for a very long time. Um, and the city wanted to alleviate that. They wanted to get these buildings in good ownership's hands where they could be managed well and that the repairs would get done. Um, and so I think everybody was on the same page about that happening. And so um, there was a large commitment from the city, from HDC, in terms of bond financing, a large commitment from HPD in terms of putting subsidy, low-cost subsidy. That low-cost subsidy actually allows you um, to get a first loan from, from, from HTC so that you can put more dollars into the, into the projects. And then there was enormous commitment of tax credit equity uh, from NEF and from Morgan Stanley to buy tax credit, tax credit equity um, so that we could provide low income or low cost subsidy into these projects um, and get the amount of work that needed to get done. You could only do this type of work um, with help from the city because you can't generate enough through private market financing only to, uh, to, to do the, the complete work that's needed in these units. I just want to um, say something that kind of unites a couple of the previous questions, which is the, the process that we've gone through over these last few months uh, in terms of mandatory inclusionary zoning, in terms of uh, zoning for quality and affordability. Uh, I've been, you know, I was a city council member for eight years. I've been through a lot of discussions with an administration. Now I've been on the administration side of those discussions. This has been a very substantial discussion and negotiation. And I don't want people to miss the fact that in the context of these kind of conversations, people actually can come to some agreement. Uh, we said from the beginning that what we're doing on mandatory inclusionary zoning would be the most progressive housing policy in the country. It would require the most of developers uh, of any major city in America by locking in the notion <coughs> that uh, major development, uh, any place there was a rezoning, whether it was a, a neighborhood rezoning or an individual building rezoning, that that would come within the re requirement of affordable housing. That's never been done on any appreciable scale anywhere in this country. So I think it is fair that some of the uh, activist groups looked at that and they wanted to be convinced uh, that we were going to do that on as big a scale as possible, reach as much affordability as possible. And I have to tell you, there have been a number of conversations when, uh, when people really looked at the details and became a lot more satisfied. Uh, again, doesn't mean they don't want us to keep going farther, doesn't mean the study isn't going to be important. It means that there's been a real give and take to understand the breadth of our vision. And I am very comfortable saying put this up against uh, the affordable housing policies of every major city in America, this, when it's passed, will be the most progressive, will demand the most of developers of any city in America. Yes. Could you talk about the dollar amounts um, for this particular project overall, how much city money is being um, contributed to this particular project, and also who owns these properties? Uh, okay, so Vicki, Gary, whoever wants to jump in on the so, so um, let me just uh, start, and then uh, Gary can provide some uh, some more of the money details. The total development cost across the um, uh, the 368 units is about 70 million dollars. 
um, and that comes from a variety of sources. But I, I really want to make one point to also tie together, as the mayor was doing, the, the various strands here. When we face a preservation pro project like this, um, often in the past, the way that the preservation needs, which any building after 15 years, after 30 years, needs preservation work, right? Any building, the boiler runs out, et cetera. Um, that is usually financed in a couple of ways. And in the past, it was often financed by letting some of the units go higher mar towards market, right? That is not what happened here. What happened here is that we, the, the units that were becoming available are now available for formerly homeless. They're, they're very deeply subsidized. So we're using our preservation programs along with our new construction, along with mandatory inclusionary to try to always be reaching deeper. And this is just, I think this is a very good example of, of how that exactly happens. So Gary, then. So just to piggyback on what the commissioner said, <clears throat> um, my agency, HTC, provided a little over $33 million in taxes and bond financing. That allowed us to leverage another $24 plus million from NEF and Morgan Stanley. In addition to that, HPD provided a significant amount of subsidy. Those various layers, <clears throat> the important thing to kind of pull out from all of that is what the commissioner just mentioned. All of that allowed us to do the renovation, allowed Genesis to do the renovation work that's currently happening, but keep the rents at affordable levels. If it was not the case, <clears throat> to provide $70 million worth of finance would have required a significant increase in the rents, and probably most of the tenants here would not be able to stay. Abyssinian Development Corporation. Abyssinian Development Corporation. Last call on this topic. Going once. Is that still on this topic? All right, go ahead. Wait, I'm looking for water. I don't see water. There's some water out there somewhere. Go ahead. Uh, separate but related on the uh, bond cap issue, it seems like both the Assembly and the Senate are not embracing the governor's proposed changes to these tax exempt bonds. I was wondering if you have any news or are you hearing anything from people you talk to to that end? Yeah, I'm hearing that the Assembly and the Senate are not embracing uh, the governor's proposal. <laughs> and uh, I think in a democratic system, that's a rather uh, striking statement. So, uh, you know, we said from the beginning that we thought this would make it harder to create affordable housing and would slow the process down. And I think it's quite clear the Senate and the Assembly agree. And we appreciate uh, their support and look forward to working with them because we need to, in fact, speed up the supply of affordable housing, not slow it down. Anything left on affordable housing? Okay, going once, going twice. Any topic? Uh, we saw last week uh, over about half the schools in Newark have, were, had their water shut down because of lead leaching in from the pipes. Um, can you assure New York students and parents that our schools' water and pipes are safe, and how big of a concern is that to them? Yeah, I can assure, I, you know, until last June, I was a public school parent myself, so I can assure my fellow parents that our water in our schools is safe. We have a very rigorous testing regime uh, in New York City. Our uh, Department of Environmental Protection is legendary for what it's done with our water supply. We have uh, an extraordinary natural water supply in this city. Uh, and we test constantly, uh, and we have no indication of a problem in any of our schools. We will remain vigilant if we see anything that indicates that there might be a problem in any given building. We'll certainly look at it immediately, but to date, I have no report of a problem in any of our buildings. Emily. Uh, you've been very clear about your, how you feel about Donald Trump, the candidate, but I wanted to ask you about his supporters, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I guess how violent or conservative or xenophobic they might reflect the nation to be, and what they say about the state of our country. I, I don't think that's our country. I think our country is increasingly tolerant. Our country is increasingly embracing of all kinds of Americans. I think we have a lot of evidence of that. I think that's particularly true of the generation coming up. And if you want an easy example, the the way this country matured on the topic of marriage equality in the course of you know nine or ten years was amazing to watch. Uh, and I think there's other good examples like that. So, no, I don't think uh, the people at his rallies reflect the majority of Americans. I don't think his platform reflects the majority of Americans. 
That doesn't mean I take him lightly. I think we should understand that what he's doing is deadly serious, and we should uh, be very, very quick to address it uh, and not uh, for a moment underestimate the threat posed by Mr. Trump. But what he's saying is, uh, it, by the way, it's not just xenophobia. It's not just racism. It's not just inciting violence and commending violence amongst his supporters. He's throwing militarism into the mix now, too. If you heard him a few days ago, he was saying, you know, we should send American troops into the Middle East, and they'd uh, do the job and come home soon. We've heard that for decades. It's never true. But, you know, it's his effort to try and whip up nationalist fervor. These are very, very dangerous signs, and we've seen them in history before. We've seen this combination of elements before, and they don't, they don't end well. Uh, so uh, I think his supporters are a mix of people, but I agree with the statement that he is responsible for what happens at his own rallies. And uh, the message he sent has encouraged violence. I mean, you've heard him say, I'd like to punch that guy in the mouth and, you know, go get that protester. Uh, the way his own security personnel have acted uh, has not comported with our democratic values. This guy's dangerous. And I think more and more people are waking up to it. It doesn't mean he has a majority. It means there are some people who support him. And again, I think there are some people who go to those rallies out of curiosity. There are some people who go to those rallies to protest him. There are some people who go to those rallies because they're frustrated with their economic reality. By the way, they're right. Their economic reality isn't fair uh, because middle class and working class people in this country have been going backwards over the last 30 years. So that economic frustration is not uh, illegitimate. It's quite real. But uh, that doesn't mean they all buy into uh, the rest of what he's saying, but unfortunately there are some people who go to those rallies and express overt uh, racism and xenophobia. And uh, a responsible leader should say that's unacceptable, and I don't want to be associated with that, and you shouldn't do that. We, you've many times the press corps has rightfully asked people to disassociate from uh, supporters who have said inappropriate things or done inappropriate things. He stokes the inappropriate actions. And I, I really, you know, I, I didn't need to know anymore, but when he was asked the question about David Duke and the KKK, and it was so obvious he did not want to answer the question because he didn't want to alienate some of his supporters. Uh, I don't know anyone who has to hesitate when it comes to David Duke and the KKK. You know, that, the KKK represents the worst in American history, overt, violent racism. Why did he hesitate? And then, you know, days later, he bragged about the fact that he put some separation between him and them. Uh, what was much more telling was at the point of contact, he could not muster a condemnation of the KKK. That's so far outside the American mainstream, it's unbelievable. And that's why he has to be stopped. Yeah. Shift gears a little bit. We're right now in the uh, 13th congressional district, which is having, a, of course, one of the most competitive congressional races in the whole city. Uh, you know, last, uh, last time around 2014, you sort of sat out uh, mm -hmm. breaking with your predecessor. Uh, do you anticipate that you will make an endorsement eventually, or do you foresee yourself sitting out again? No plans at this moment. There's time, obviously, but no plans at this moment. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Senator Keith Wright, who's seeking a seat, has proposed numerous things, including uh, turning NYCHA over to the state of New York and control of Governor Cuomo. Does that make it less likely that you will endorse him? I've worked with Keith Wright uh, many, many years, and I like him. I was very surprised by that proposal. He didn't call me to talk to me about it. I found that. Uh, you know, surprising, and I think it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, obviously, the problems at the Housing Authority have to be solved here in the city of New York, and not by uh, bureaucrats 150 miles away. Uh, but again, it's, I have no plans to be involved at this moment. Could you comment on a current uh, PBA survey that seems to indicate an all-time low morale among the refugee I don't put a lot of stock in that survey. Um, it, it certainly is not a survey of a majority of our officers. I don't know who did the survey. I don't know which officers they chose to uh, talk to, but I can tell you this much. Uh, the men and women of the NYPD are doing their job and doing it really, really well, and better than ever. Uh, they're continuing to drive down crime. Uh, they are working aggressively to get guns off our streets. Uh, they have a lot to be proud of, and we're very proud of them. And uh, I have to tell you, I think what officers care about is getting uh, the best training, the best technology, uh, the bulletproof vests that are the best quality. Um, they care about, of course, having 
the backup they deserve, and we are in the process of increasing patrol strength by 2,000 officers in the course of this year, first increase in patrol strength in 15 years. Uh, that is all going to make the work and the lives of the men and women of the NYPD better. Uh, so I think that's what we should be talking about. How do we get the job done? How do we support our officers? How do we support our communities? But um, unfortunately, a lot of what I hear from the PBA is uh, complaints, not constructive uh, suggestions or an effort to work for the betterment of all. And I'm much more interested in how we get the job done. Yeah. Um, the state Senate's one house budget has rejected the governor's uh, call for a three year extension of mayoral control of schools. Um, what do you foresee as your plan to get that extended? Um, it seems like odds are they're waiting until after the budget and want to have you up for a hearing. As, as Which I've told uh, Leader Flanagan I would welcome and I would participate in personally. I made that very clear to him uh, this year and last year. Um, uh, so my understanding is the Senate didn't pass judgment. I agree with you. I think they'll look at this going forward. But I welcome that dialogue. We have the highest graduation rate that we've ever had in New York City, over 70%. We have full day pre-K for all. We have after school for all our middle school kids. We're making unprecedented investments in education. Computer science for all is gonna be online more and more. I welcome uh, that discussion and I think we have a lot of evidence to show and I can certainly say there's a real broad cross section of New Yorkers, including in the business community, labor community, uh, obviously educators who believe in mayoral control uh, that's a discussion I would be happy to participate in. I've already sat down with him, obviously, and talked to him about this, and I've certainly made my case to him. Uh, it was a very good and respectful meeting. I think he, he heard my points. I'm not saying he agreed with all of them, but he heard them. Uh, he knows a lot about education, obviously, from his own work on the Education Committee in the Senate. Uh, and I, I welcome a dialogue. I told him I will happily appear at a hearing anytime he needs. I, I don't know why that uh, assumption has gotten out there. We um, have made very clear that we're spending an additional billion dollars over the next four years on efforts to reduce homelessness. And, um, we, and we're also in the middle of a budget process where we're going to assess what more we may need to do. So uh, to date, we have added to prevention programs. We've put in place uh, a lot of prevention programs that didn't exist in the previous administration. We've restored the kind of subsidy efforts that were needed since the Advantage program was uh, canceled by the previous administration in 2011. We've uh, committed to 15,000 units of supportive housing, the most ever by the city government. And we're this month uh, launching the Homestat effort, which will be the biggest outreach effort for the homeless uh, of any city in America. That's all involves major investment to bring this problem under control and to start to reduce homelessness. So I know there was a study out today. I don't think it fully took into account all those facts. And uh, I don't think it took into account the fact that we're in the middle of the budget process. But specifically to homeless shelters, you said that there was uh, 120, $120 million taken out of uh, homeless shelters in 2011. Is that correct? Again, I cannot place how they're getting those figures, given everything I just told you. Uh, and uh, again, the fact that we're in the middle of a budget process where we're still evolving uh, the next budget. So I, I don't think that's a fair analysis. Um, back to the PBA study for a sec, or survey. Um, you question the accuracy of it. Um, is that because, you, are you saying the PBA can't be objective in doing this study, or what, what, why is it? I just said exactly what I felt. I don't know how they did it, who they surveyed, what the methodology was, was it objective or not. I just know that we're doing a lot of the things that our officers need to do their job better, and our officers are responding by doing an exemplary job, and we should be focused on what's productive. Did you get any heads up from Pat no. Lynch about this? No. Yes. Excuse me? It's Pi Day. It's Pi Day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, will you be calibrating it? It's good. It's good to know, Emily. I did not. I, I, I have to say my staff has let me down in a grievous manner by not providing me a memo explaining it is Pi Day. Karen, this is an abomination. It's Pi Day, apparently. March 14, 3.4 million. 
14 pi pi, but also pi like. You're in pretty deep here, Emily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, um, so given the violence that has happened at the Trump um, gatherings, and given what you describe as his stoking of the violence, do you think it's wise for the protest groups to continue to try to infiltrate, if you will, his, his rallies, or do you think it would be wiser for them to take some other approach? I think people are very, very worried about where this is going. And um, I understand why a lot of people are responding by protesting. Now, they should protest in whatever manner the police deem appropriate. I mean the police, the actual police, not the Trump security force. Uh, the, uh, in some cases that might be inside the hall, in some cases that might be outside. But the impulse to say this is unacceptable and we're going to stand up to it and we're going to show in a very vibrant way that this does not represent, represent American values or American democracy, that's exactly right. And I commend them for making their voices heard. Anyone who wants to protest needs to do it in a nonviolent manner and needs to follow whatever the rules set forward are by the police. Or if they choose to get arrested under civil disobedience, that's their right too, but they still need to follow uh, the instructions of the police. Okay. You took right, Donald Trump at length, and obviously have endorsed Hillary Clinton. Do you any of the Republicans that you think are more tolerable than others? Well, obviously, uh, the Donald Trump is different than the rest. Um, but I also am very struck how few will disavow him. And I don't understand how anyone uh, running for president or anyone who has run for president as a Republican this year could stand idly by uh, and say, well, if he's nominated, I'll support him after the things he said. I, I think they're you know, digging the grave of the Republican Party if they're going to present a party that's uh, racist, anti-Mexican, anti-Muslim, anti-woman, anti-immigrant, and expect to have a majority in America, they, they're really missing something. So, of course, I have different views of each uh, individual Republican, but what I want to see is more Republicans stand up and say, not on my watch, I won't support this guy under any uh, condition. And a lot of these candidates haven't done that. They need to. Have you studied any of the candidate platforms or policies on how they would affect the city and the urban agenda that you've I, I think You mean in terms of Republicans? Oh, uh, of course, of course. And I look, I supported Hillary Clinton because she put together an agenda that really addresses income inequality. And that agenda being implemented would have a huge positive impact for New York City. There's no question about it. Uh, under her vision, the federal government would actually get involved again on issues like affordable housing uh, and infrastructure and the kinds of things that would fundamentally improve the lives of everyday New Yorkers. But I also think her agenda would help people all over the country. I think there's a lot of great items in Bernie Sanders' agenda. I think, unfortunately, from everything I've seen of the Republican platforms, there's still trickle-down economics, which has been proven unworkable. Uh, so there's a big divide between the two parties, a starker divide than I think has been in a long time. Uh, I'm very confident, though, that Hillary Clinton will be the nominee, will be the president, and I think her policies will help the people of New York City quite a bit. Thanks very much, everyone.